OK, let's move on to something a little bit more contentious. Questions about the data and the presentation of the data in the long and the short of it. Don't let these questions detract from the value of the overall principles in the report. They're undoubtedly right. Concentrate on a blend of long-term and short-term activities. It's just some of the data... Well, let's take a look. First of all, the data set itself. The long and the short of it is based on 996 entries into the IPA's competition for best advertising between 1980 and 2010. 996 does sound like a big number, but over 30 years, it's actually only about 30 entries per year. Probably more importantly, the key thing to think about is that it's based on competition entries. It'll inevitably be biased against campaigns that didn't work. Agencies and their clients don't enter failed campaigns into competitions. Consequently, the charts that say X percent of campaigns said that this worked should actually say X percent of the successful campaigns that we know about worked. There could be lots of other campaigns that were run during this time period using the same techniques but that didn't work and the campaign database wouldn't know about that. I suppose we can't even be sure that the database contains all of the successful campaigns during that time period either. Collating the data and the background information and submitting the competition entry would require time and that might be an investment some clients or their agencies wouldn't be prepared to do. Lastly, as you can see from this chart, only 237 of the campaigns in the database lasted more than three years. And that's critical for a report that is studying the relative virtues of long and short term campaigns. Long term is used in this report to mean three years or more. And there are only 237 campaigns that long, over 30 years. That's a small data set, surely. Second problem, presentation of data in charts. I remember my O-level mathematics. Yep, I go back well before GCSEs. And I remember that when you chart percentages, the axis on your chart goes from 0 to 100, because the clue's in the name, percent. If you do choose to ignore that rule, then if you're comparing data, you've got to make sure that the axes use the same scale. But that's not how data is presented in this report. Take a look at figures 11, 12 and 13 that are popping up here. They're trying to compare the relative effect of multi-year campaigns on price, sales and profit. And yet each of the three graphs uses a different axis. One goes to 4%, one goes to 40% and one is in the middle at 18%. This begs the question, what should we expect from charts in any report like this? And the word, and I'm a bit uncomfortable about this, the word I keep on coming back to is honesty. Because the way this data is presented is not honest. It's actually quite deceptive. It's creating a visual impression that doesn't reflect the true nature of the data that underpins it. If you plot that same data from figures 11, 12 and 13 honestly, this is what it looks like. When you see data like this, you reach some conclusions that Binet and Field don't. For example, over 60% of these successful campaigns do not show large effects on profit, price or sales, even over three years. Contrary to what you might think from figure 11, only a tiny proportion of successful campaigns have a very large effect on price, even after three years. And that number hardly grows over three years. It goes from 2.9 to 3.1% in the last year. You can only make that seem like a big change if you chart it like Binet and Field have done in figure 11. It's hard to agree with the conclusion on price effects that they're still rising strongly after three years, they went from 2.9% to 3.1% between years 2 and 3. That's about as strong as a wet tissue. So consider this from a business perspective. 
If you wanted a campaign that was going to have a very large effect on price, would you want to adopt a campaign that after three years only worked 3% of the time? That means it didn't work 97% of the time. Or if you wanted a campaign that had a strong effect on profit, would you choose a technique that only worked 15% of the time after three years? I.e. after three years, 85% of the time, the technique didn't work. Presenting this data might help a marketing department choose between one technique and another, but it does put us at risk of over-promoting something. Figure 40, for example, shows that TV and posters are the two channels that have the strongest effect on brand uplift, but it's still only 27% successful. That result should be presented like this. The data in both of those last two charts is the same, it just creates a very different visual impression. Third problem, making data fit the conclusions. I love outside work reading whodunits and thrillers. And when you ever hear about the cops in those, they're always told, let the evidence leave you to the perpetrator. Don't fixate on one perpetrator and then try and make the evidence fit them. That's the principle that came to mind when I was reading the long and the short of it, because sometimes I wonder if the conclusions are actually there in the data. What, for example, do they consider to be a success? I've already mentioned the strange case of figure 11, which considered a move from 2.9% to 3.1% as strong growth. You do wonder what weak growth would look like. There are equally strange conclusions drawn from other data too. Take a look at figure 48. This compares the relative effect of emotional and rational campaigns on a variety of metrics. What's strange is the effective emotional campaigns on pricing and loyalty is promoted, it's reflected as doubled, whereas their effect on sales and share is a little bit downgraded. It says only marginal growth. Well, that's one way of looking at the data, because you can agree that 5% is more than double of 2%, and 11% is more than double 5%. But you can also see that 55% of emotional campaigns affect sales, whereas only 46% of rational campaigns do. Now that's a 9% improvement for emotional campaigns, and yet it's reported as a marginal improvement. Emotional campaigns also perform 3% better than rational campaigns for market share. So 3%, not a big number, Perhaps you could call it marginal, but it is the same as the difference or the advantage of emotional campaigns affecting price. We also have to wonder how many campaigns we're talking about. We're talking about long-term campaigns, so we know there are only 237 of those in the database. How many of those were emotional campaigns? We don't actually know that, but whatever the number, only 5% of them had a strong effect on pricing. So are we talking about 10 campaigns over 30 years? Next problem relates to connecting numbers together. Binet and Field suggest that a business gains market share at a rate of 0.05 times their excess share of voice. So if it has 1% excess share of voice over its competitor, it will, in time, gain 0.05% market share. Or, to use their way of putting it, if they gain 20% excess share of voice, they get 1% extra market share over time. That begs the question, is it worth it? If you're not entrenched in the marketing industry, you'd want to compare the cost of gaining that extra 1% excess share of voice which is going to be expensive, compared to the profit you get from owning 0.05% extra share of market. We don't know that, so we can't tell if it's worth it, but the numbers don't look great. Next problem, cutting data too fine. Section three of the report starts a discussion on different types of emotional campaigns. 
They can be fame campaign or classified as emotional involvement. And remember that emotional campaigns are one of two types of general campaign, emotional or rational. The problem is that the database isn't that big to begin with, and it brought a saying to mind. If you cut bread, you get slices. If you cut it too fine, you get crumbs. The small data set is acknowledged when discussing some of the campaigns. But the report's caveat takes a bizarre twist. It says, the absolute levels might be low, but this is because businesses seldom measure price elasticity. This invites us to assume that a bigger data set would reinforce the conclusion. But a bigger data set could also contradict the conclusion. Think of it this way. If I did a survey asking you about your favourite members of the Spice Girls and asked you about sporty, scary, posh and baby and said that, ah, oh, well probably you'd have picked the fifth one if I could remember who it was, you'd laugh me out of court. You can't draw conclusions from data that isn't there. Or at least I didn't think you could. Next problem is causation. With short-term effects, you're relatively safe, maybe, to assume that A caused B because nothing else had time to have an effect. But during a long-term three-year campaigns, there are lots of other things that can affect a company, its markets, the national economy or the global economy. Remember, a lot of these campaigns were happening during the recovery from the 2008 financial crisis and at the start of the run-up to the 2016 Brexit vote. These were turbulent times. Metrics such as sales, profit and pricing would all have been affected. Finally, the report draws on psychological research that says that automatic emotional and fast factors influence the decision making on purchasing more than cognitive and slow factors. That's one of the reasons emotional brand building works better over the long term. If you build that emotional connection, people automatically select a particular brand. The difficulty is that we might be tempted to ignore other purchasing factors that are also automatic, emotional or fast. Factors that have nothing to do with brand or even marketing. Factors that might be more powerful and influential than both. Think about it. A purchase could be automatic, emotional and fast because it's geographically convenient. I'll buy A from bargain base while I'm there buying B. A purchase could be automatic, emotional and fast because it's domestically convenient. By that I mean I better buy A, not B, otherwise my son will give me hell. Or it could be automatic, emotional and fast because it's channel or channel brand influenced. I'll buy A because it's available in the farm shop and I trust the farm shop. So it's got nothing to do with A's brand, it's all about the farm shop. If we accept the premise that automatic, emotional and fast factors have a stronger influence than other type of factors, then we have to recognise that brand is only one of the levers we need to pull. So, in summary, I think you'll be glad that you've read the long and the short of it. It'll either reveal or reinforce a long and short term way of thinking about your business that'll help your business. But it'll also make you a little bit worried if you read it carefully. Its nature and source data do mean that it looks at marketing slash advertising in isolation. Does it adequately take other factors that could affect a business into consideration? Probably not. It left me sitting rather uncomfortably between two extremes. On the one side you have the Trumps of this world who don't believe anything unless it conforms to their worldview. On the other extreme you have researchers and academics who produce reports that probably draw more conclusions out of data than the data actually contains. And in the middle, you have the rest of us who are desperately trying to run our businesses based on fact and reason, but a little bit uncomfortable about the facts that we're being given. Thanks for watching.